Activate defenses. Activate defenses. Commence countdown. Ten minutes and counting. Nine minutes and counting. Eight minutes and counting. Seven minutes and counting. Six minutes and counting. Five minutes and counting. Four minutes and counting. Three minutes and counting. Two minutes and counting. One minute and counting. Forty seconds and counting. Hello, David Zaritsky for The Bond Experience. Welcome to the 2022 Oscars. I'm your, no, no, no. This is, of course, The Bond Book Club, hashtag Fleming Reading Challenge Special. And we are talking today about The Man with the Golden Gun. I am so tempted to sing that. I don't know what it is. I think it's because of the way I was brought up. I'm tempted to sing it, but we're talking about the novel today. So if you showed up to talk about knickknack and uh, and Tabasco sauce, that's probably somebody else's YouTube live stream. Great to see everybody in here. Hello. We've got a great crowd, and I had a feeling we would because this is kind of an interesting one. But ladies and gentlemen, please buckle up. Welcome to the Bond Book Club. <laughs> All right, enough happiness. I got to bring this on to a somber note. We're going to start off somber, and then we're going to lift this party with really good people. You'll see. Uh, first of all, let me just kind of acknowledge everybody. Um, we've got uh, uh, we've got Anna. Look at that. How are you? We've got DT UK. We've got Morgan Lindsay. Hello, hello. Everybody's saying hello to each other. Um, hey, David, saw you on this morning show. Yes, it was a while ago. Are they doing reruns? That would be amazing. Mark Sampton, I'm excited to do this. Awesome soundtrack. Well, that's that's Joe Darlington's creativity. If only he was here today. Well, we'll see. Um, hello, hello. Uh, okay, it's fixed. Not sure what that's referring to, but we've got so many people. This is what happens when a lot of people show up. It just starts scrolling. Let me kind of roll it backwards. First of all, I'm so happy to be in what may be one of the last Bond books we talk about. Um, first of all, little pomp and circumstance. This is a Bond book club. And a part of this is getting friends together and just having great, comfortable conversations. Lots of opinions, all of them matter, and none of them matter. In other words, we're all going to be friends afterwards. Um, speaking of friends, here's my first friend. It's Red Stripe. Hmm. I like to theme this with different drinks. It's cool and refreshing, but... Bond drinks a lot of bourbon in this. He's, he, and you, you know what? He drinks double bourbon. So what did I do? I got a triple bourbon. Because damn it, I don't want to be undone by Bond. And there's this giant like Death Star like globe of a of a rock in there. And that is ice. And supposedly that's going to melt a little bit slower. So I've got my beer. I've got my bourbon. I've got my buddies. This is This is turning out to be a good show. All right. I told you I'm going to take it down a notch. Here we go. Man with the Golden Gun, you know this. It's the 12th and final novel of Ian Fleming. It's uh, the 13th Bond book overall. The novel, you know this already if you read it. It's not as detailed or polished as the others in the series. Um, there were some poor reviews. We're going to be talking about that. Despite all that, it's James Bond. It's Ian Fleming. It's 1964. Sean Connery's movies are taking off. So guess what? This is still a bestseller. So we're going to treat it with a certain amount of relevance. But Ian Fleming wrote The Man with the Golden Gun at his Golden Eye Estate in Jamaica in January and February of 1964, completing it by the beginning of March. Um, the folks at Golden Eye said in Fleming's last years, especially, uh, he would not go down to the beach as much. His routine that we talk about would wane. Uh, the drinks and the smoking continued aplenty, but his activity was really waning. And he went from doing 2,000 words a day down to only one hour a day. That's all he could really muster. Um, you could tell when we talk about the book, there's a lot of replication that goes on, and it is a thinner book. But he did return to Britain with a completed first draft of the manuscript in March and wrote to the copy editor of all his novels, William Plomer, saying it needed a lot of rewriting. Now, let's pause for a moment. 
when Fleming comes back, like any good author, there's usually a first draft, then there's probably a second draft, and then there's a third draft, and they get better and better, and they add the, the Fleming tropes, and they add the Fleming details. This only got through one draft, and unfortunately, uh, as he waited around to fix this due to poor health, Ian Fleming had a heart attack and passed away. Told you this would be a bummer of an opening. Um, William Plomer wanted it rewritten. He actually approached Kingsley Amos, uh, offering him 35 whopping pounds. Hoofa. I guess there was no uh, employee protection back then. Um, and Amos gave suggestions about how to fix the book. They did not take it. And a big part of that was because of pressure of feeling, much like you would today, that people would look at the changes and say, well, hold on a second. We love Fleming. We love Bond. And now it's been, who's this Amos guy? Who's this Kingsley Amos guy? And so none of the changes were made. And that's why we have the book today. Okay. I've set the table. All right. Let's, let's get into it. Let me take a sip of Red Stripe, Jamaican. Because I cannot unwrap this golden package by myself. I need to invite some people. We have an international, international guest panelist today. And speaking of international, um, I'd like to bring on the gentleman who was actually voted in the Bond community least, the most likely to take over for Amy Schumer in next year's Oscars. Calvin Dyson, welcome to the show. <laughs> Hello, David. Thank you very much for having me on. I'm very impressed with your uh, pair of drinks there. That is, I don't think I've ever seen you drink beer before. This is a first for me. You know, if I want something cold and refreshing, it's pretty warm here. It's like in the early 60s. You can see I've got a little bit of like Goldfinger suntan today, which means I'm burnt. Um, but yeah, I just wanted something kind of cold and refreshing. What are you, what are you drinking? Well, we had snow flurries earlier on today, if you can imagine that, I know. Well, so, so I wanted something really warming and, you know, Jamaican. So got some Blackwell rum here, which I'm of course having with some Diet Coke. So, um, yep. Cheers. I love it. <laughs> By the way, there is so much love for you. Uh, Calvin, oh, Calvin, nice. greetings, Calvin. Everybody's... <laughs> digging you your channel is going crazy and you i think you're doing like at least one video every sunday right i i was doing until um until the big no time to die uh video which which after, after that i kind of i did that big two hour plus <laughs> review of no time to die which uh burnt me out a little bit so i'm taking a little bit of a break and then yeah should be back in the next few weeks uh back on the usual sundays well First of all, then thank you so much for spending your time here. This is great. And we'll count this as your Sunday entry then. <laughs> well, I am doing a live stream tomorrow as well. So, uh, well, that's great. Well, we'll talk about yeah. that at the end. Um, all right. So, by the way, look at this. Look at this. Martin Barrett. Calvin, your recent oh. in-depth No Time to Die review was great fun. Thanks. Oh, thank you, Martin. Thank you. All right. We could talk about Calvin all day, but we actually do have more people. Um, this next gentleman was voted in the Bond community most likely not to forget George Lazenby's name at an Oscar presentation. So, Joe Darlington, being James Bond. Hello, Did Hello we gentlemen. You? How are you? Joe, you were supposed to finish reading like a week ago. Is this is this today? I, I thought I had a, I had a couple more days for this. So sorry, sorry about that. But by the way, show everybody your professorial glasses. Those are impressive. Yeah, and I, I started with a professorial jacket as well, but it, it but as you said, it's pretty warm today. So I figured, eh, we're it's not going to really use warm. Stuff. I'll just I'll just do a little little less to. Now, Joe, fun. Joe, I have to tell you, as much as uh, Calvin's been prolific, you've been focusing on community, career, um, your your wonderful significant other, and this is wonderful because when I announced that you were coming on the show, it was almost like a reunion. People were like so happy that you were on. Is this is this going to be a trend to see you more often? Uh, I, absolutely, I hope so. Yeah, I, I'm. I am getting very settled um, in a lot of ways. So, so I'm very happy to. I, I think. I think I can finally start getting back into some more videos. And uh, I, I, I still sort of say to myself, I can't believe that the movie we spent six years pining for came out, and and it was kind of like, oh, okay, that, that's done. All right, we talked about it. We're good. Calvin, your your two hour thing was spectacular. I, I ate it oh, all thanks. and watched it all in one sitting. It was spectacular. Oh, thanks! In one sitting, that's that's brave. <laughs> I, I did it in one sitting. You can't really, oh, you can't break it up. It's like a movie. You don't want to step away. I, I, if I could do three hours in the movie, I could certainly do two hours of Calvin talking about it. Absolutely. 
Well, listen, we, we've got to break this love fest because we've got somebody too. And, you know, as much as Joe Darlington has written one book in the last 28 years um, with, a, with a promise of number two to come out with Bond 28, uh, <laughs> lots of zingers. It's like, wow. Um, <laughs> we do have an accomplished author, but also a Bond aficionado. And according to the recent poll that I have here in the Bond community, most likely to slap Will Smith, we've got Roland Hume. How are you? I'm good. I'm just getting a slap hand ready. Yeah, dude, you 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 came with your slap hand, cocked and ready. <laughs> that sounds quite dirty when you say it like that. Don't cock it up, please. <laughs> That's all that. Roland, how are you? I am very well, thank you, and thank you so much for having me on uh, on this. I was there at the start. I'm going to see it through to the end, and I could not be happier with the 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 wonderful people I get to to spend this afternoon with. I mean, look at this. Roland, first, first of all, hey, someone Ray. says Ro Roland is a saint. Uh, Alex, Alex and I, we have a, a we are fans of the saint, the old uh, Leslie Charteris books. I was going to say because, yeah, because uh, I don't know if he knows you to, to call you a saint. That's uh, when you get to know him, he's a bit of a devil, but we love that about him. By the way, are you drinking the same thing Calvin's drinking? I, I'm going to make myself a cocktail, but yeah, I am. I thought this is kind of Amazing. like a little treat. <laughs> which is perfect like because rum this, buddies well yeah this yeah this this book takes place a lot in jamaica so this is really appropriate and joe bad on me i didn't look at you come on red stripe joe what are you drinking today uh i i, I you know for me saint patrick's day becomes sort of a month-long thing um so i just decided to sort of i, I i'm doing an irish coffee nice um but since since I, I can't do the um, the whipped cream as much anymore as I used to, it's really just kind of a spiked coffee. So nice. And do you have uh, like something to keep spiking it? Because this is going to be a long discussion. <laughs> just 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 what I got here. Yeah. But well, it, first it, of all, it'll, it'll good. It, even a, even a, even a spiked coffee is going to do. Uh, gentlemen, ladies, and other gentlemen, and everybody else, cheers, everybody. Welcome, welcome. We'll do a quick toast. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. That is good. So I'm drinking. Um, it's actually called a, a it's a, called a black bourbon, and it's infused through coffee beans, which is a little bougie, but um, it's, it's it's tasty. It'll hold me. Do you get a, a caffeine kick from it? No, because um, it's not ground beans. It just hmm. picks up the flavor of the coffee, but doesn't give you really the caffeine. Oh, nice. Hmm. Although if I'm like even more jittery than usual, please call it out. That's all I ask. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, uh, we are going to start our engines here. And uh, I, I read that discussion because I really did want to set the table a little bit differently from the other books because I want us to kind of tear this apart. But let's stay really high level. And Calvin, we're going to start with you. This is typically where we go through and say just overall, you know, overall, you know, even compared to the other books, what did you think of the book? What was your experience like reading it? Well, this was a bit of a, uh, I, I was really um, appreciative, actually, um, that you asked me to be on this one, because The Man with the Golden Gun, this is only the second time I'm reading this. The first time I read it was a good few years ago when I went through all the Flemings for the first time and were, you know, reading them through um, in sequence. So that that was literally a case of, you know, closing You Only Live Twice on the Sunday and picking this up on the Monday. And I feel like, I feel like that might not actually be the best way to experience this book. Now I'm coming into this, I've been going through some of the John Gardners. So mm. I just, after about two years of trying, I finally got through this and then finished that on Sunday, picked up Man with the Golden Gun on Monday. And I think just coming into it completely fresh after so many years and you know, not thinking about On Her Majesty's Secret Service, You Only Live Twice, which are two of my absolute favorite Flemings. And this following up, initially, like, yes, it, it was a disappointment when I first read it. And it feels kind of, uh, not disrespectful exactly, but, um, uh, you, you know, it, it was written by a man who was dying, basically, and he couldn't even finish it to maybe the extent that he wanted to. Yeah. He was aware of its flaws by all accounts, and, you know, maybe with some more editing it would have gotten there. All that being said, I had a really good time with it this um, time coming back to it. And I don't know if that's just because immediately going to it from some of the continuation novels that I've been reading, it just really, e even in this book, Fleming's uh, descriptions, um, his characters, it even though when you're reading all the Flemings through sequentially, 
this one is lesser than some of his others. I think compared to some of the continuation novels that I've read, you know, recently, it's still like above that. So I'm, um, yeah, I, I came away from it much more positive this time. I, I think we're going to obviously get into it as we, oh, yeah. um, you know, go through it in more detail. But um, yeah, overall, I was more positive about it this time. I love that because I, I mentioned to Calvin before we went live today, I said, uh, in preparation, I went back and saw your review. And you really did feel, I think, similarly to a lot of the critics back then, that it was really missing a lot of the Fleming moments until the end. And we'll talk about that. But mm -hmm. it's great to hear that even upon a revisit, it may have improved with mm -hmm. your either maturity, time, or experience. But Joe, what about you? What uh, what was kind of like your overarching view of it? Uh, overarching view, and I'm glad I didn't have to go first. Um, <laughs> this was also my second go around with this one. I, I did I did uh, a couple, just a couple of years ago, um, read it cover to cover, and this, so this is you know, and I had some initial thoughts, and uh, so this is my second time with it, and. I was kind of hoping this time around that I might like it a little better. And there were a couple of moments where I thought maybe, maybe that's going to happen. Maybe I'll, I'll sort of start to forget some of the things that I didn't like the first time. And now I'll just kind of get a little more immersed in, in the, the, the way Fleming writes and the way he describes things and stuff. Um, but oddly, yeah, I can't say that this is one of my favorites. And I think, and it's a nice change, possibly, because I know, you know, we were talking before, this is the fourth book club that I've been part of. Um, I did Casino, which I obviously gushed about. We did Thunderball, which I kind of raved about. We did Honor Majesties, which I was over the moon with. So nice to, I suppose, to come in and say, this one, I can I can prove that I'm, I, I can be honest and say, not so much. I, not, a, not a big fan of this one, and we'll get into why. Yeah, no, I, I totally get it. Um, now, Roland, you are obviously in beautiful Paris. You're probably, I mean, a beautiful Paris, how can you think of a negative thought? But I am curious how you thought about this when you read it. You'll be able to hear the taxi cab that's like honking in a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I found it fascinating because to me, as a writer, um, it was like walking into an unfinished house. Ooh. So... He built the foundations and he had the concept and everything and sort of he put up the, the, the structure and then, you know, he'd written the first act and he polished the first act. So that was polished Fleming. Then there was a second act where he was like, OK, I've got to connect these things together. And then there was a third act, which I think was what he envisioned when he came up with the idea for the book. It's like it's a beautifully simple idea. It's like Bond has to recover, prove himself. He's going up against the deadliest man. That's just a great, simple concept. And the final act, I think, is always better for not being edited because it flows so quickly and so fluidly. The first act is like classic, beautiful Bond, and it's almost a self-contained story. And then the second act is where he's like, how can we hang all these things together? And they're just ridiculously contrived coincidences that, that barely string this together. And if he'd had a chance to revisit it, hopefully he would have been able to, to bridge those gaps more effectively, but he didn't. I, all right. So, Roland, I'm going to call it right now early in the uh, in the live stream. You and I may be totally in agreement because I almost see this book when I read it from an overview is almost like an Imperial TIE fighter. You had these big wings in the beginning and big wings here and then this thin little body in the middle. And I felt like the opening was very influenced by the movies. I mean, it was 1964. You already had a couple Bond movies and he, he saw them. He was a part of the premieres. You know, it, it felt like a Bond movie with the gadgets and, you know, the things coming down and the interaction with M was wasn't that uh, robust, colorful M moment. It was kind of like a thin movie M moment. And then the ending, I thought, was pure Fleming. Lots of description. Um, it's the middle. I mean, and we're going to get into this, but Scaramanga, I, I mean, the bad guys and Joe, you've you've been a party to this. The bad guys in some of the other films were so big the gravitas of them and this scaramanga just felt like a henchman he felt like a thug so the whole book is revolving around a thug mm. um so anyway we're gonna rip this thing apart we're definitely gonna have different views um we've got from tellers with love saying go roland go roland go roland roland could play a young fraser oh i love fraser 
Frasier, that Thank TV you, show. Man. That was. <laughs> I'm quite flattered by that. I used to love that TV show. Thank you, Pete. This is, this is not about you, Roland. A Frankenstein book <laughs> of sorts. <laughs> Thankfully, uh, this was part Fleming's, part of other writers. I don't. Well, no. I mean, he they they stayed pretty true to keeping it. And to Roland's point, they didn't edit it. And I think there's some benefit to that. But all right, so let's let's open this book up a little bit. Um, obviously, it's a year after James Bond's final confrontation with Ernst Stavro Blofeld while on a mission in Japan. A man claiming to be Bond appears in London, demands to meet the head of Secret Service. M. Bond's identity is confirmed, but during his debriefing interview with M, Bond tries to kill him with a cyanide pistol, and the attempt fails. The service learns that after destroying Blofeld's castle in Japan, Bond suffered a head injury, developed amnesia. Having lived as a Japanese fisherman for several months, Bond traveled into the Soviet Union to learn his true identity. And while there, he was brainwashed and signed to kill M upon returning to England. Calvin, quite the plot. What do you think? I mean, what kind of feeling are you getting as you're, you're kind of connecting with this? I mean, that could be a whole book in itself. <laughs> There's so much material there. It's uh, it's interesting that, because uh, that's like, I think the first three chapters of this book, and then by the start of chapter four, Bond's on his mission and off he goes on another um, thing. I, I think it's, um, I think there are really exciting three chapters. I think it's a really great way to open the uh, the story. I like that we're kind of seeing some of the some of the stuff from Bond's perspective, but it's just you know we hear about this Colonel Boris, and we're like, who is this Colonel Boris? And I like when we we see things from the perspective of the MI6 group, and st- and and they all seem to be aware that something is off here. Something's not quite right. He's not the man he was. There's that lovely bit I think where Money Penny looks at Tanner and she just like shakes her head or something, or just looks at him with a look to say, yeah, this isn't right. But they're kind of just putting him through all of the different processes to get to M anyway, because I think they're just curious to see what's going to happen, and M certainly gets himself prepared for something when the huge uh, the glass screen comes down that protects him from the uh, poison that Bond shoots. I think it's really exciting, um, and, and I like... Uh, the expediency of it, I guess. If this book is to be just Bond going off on another mission, I, I think when I came to this the first time around, coming after You Only Live Twice, I'm like, what, you're not going to touch on Kissy? You're not going to touch on the, the the son that he had, apparently? Like, that's all, like, that. you know, um, quite an ending for um, You Only Live Twice to have, and then none of that is really picked up on or further explored here. Um, but just as a way to get Bond back in the service, back on a mission, I think it works very nicely. And I think it's it's some of the best passages of the book, I think, the suspense and the tension kind of building up to, to what he does. Yeah, and I, I asked you first because in previous book clubs, and even personally when you and I have talked, you relish, I mean, you eat up the M. Bond interactions in the novels. Is this one of the better ones? Is it one of the weaker ones? Where would you rate it? It, it is probably one of the weaker ones, just because we don't have much interaction between the two. Uh, you know, Bond is brainwashed, so it, mm. it, it doesn't have that same um, spice to it. I do kind of like, like, M's a, you know, he's a harsh guy. Like, his uh, whole motivation for sending Bond out on this mission is like, well, either it'll snap him out of this brainwash thing, or he dies on the job. And, you know, it's a win-win situation. Like, that's quite harsh really hearing that from m but it, it doesn't feel out of character for fleming's version of m i didn't think i, th- I thought it was um you know that whole tough love thing it his. really was well roland i mean as a writer do you sit there and and we're talking still about this first you know couple of chapters were you satisfied was it a tease where like Calvin, and I I would agree with him, you know, you so wanted to know what were the adventures, you know, in Russia and what happened. And suddenly, you know, this thing happens with him. Were you satisfied with that first opening act? You know, you said something brilliant earlier, which is about how I never say something brilliant. (laughs) You must have been mistaken. Well, you were saying how it was inspired by the the movies. It was very clearly like Hmm. the way Thunderball was written was like almost like a screenplay as opposed to Casino Royale, which was more like a a novel with a lot of introspection. By, by the was, way, Roland, to that point, check this out. Bill Koenig said in the 1960s, and I remember this, not that I was there, there was a 007 toy kit that included M at his desk, which had a tiny plexiglass thing that came up from the desk. So toys, movies, I mean, this is like merchandising bond. 
Yeah, and it was almost like coming up with a gadget. Like uh, the movies have to always come up with a gadget. This was, but um, the way it's written, if you read, if you listen to it, he's very much about show, not tell. So where Calvin was talking about like Money Penny shaking her head and stuff, he specifically wrote these things. Like she buried her face in her hands, she shook her head because he was, he was. It was almost like he was writing a screenplay and he was writing it visually. And to me, that's what really stood out. And it was like, a, and it was almost a self-contained story. It's like he came back, we learned more about him. But we, it's not like we have flashbacks. It's like it all gets explained through it in a very satisfying way. Then he has this confrontation with M and he uh, doesn't get M and then he gets sent off on his mission. And that's almost like an episode that almost wraps it up so very tightly. So I was really impressed with the first act. Nice. Joe, there was a thought that I had in the first grouping of chapters where it was almost too easy. You know, here's this guy that literally tries to kill his boss with a cyanide gun. And then suddenly it's like, well, off on a mission. And even if it was a mission of, you know, potential suicide, you're still entrusting other people. You're entrusting a mission. Um, believable. I mean, what was your takeaway? I, um, I had very similar thoughts that, that, that the word that comes to mind is contrived I, I i did feel like uh a lot of conveniences and we're just going to kind of do things on faith that we normally never would would take such a big leap um i and you said earlier that fleming it feels like he's starting to write movies now instead of writing novels he he is very well aware that bond now is and again this is way past the whole thunderball thing well we, we're well into the era of knowing that, you know, writing for, for, for the screen is just a, a big part of this now. So, so um, the whole purpose feels different. So mm -hmm. when you get that scene, he goes into M's office and the big plexiglass thing comes down. I remember feeling like, I, I feel like I'm watching a, I'm reading a screenplay. Um, so that is clearly being written for screen. Um, and, you know, and again, not to skip ahead, but I feel like it, it, throughout the whole book, I'm feeling that a lot. Um, and yeah, the fact that M, after a literal assassination attempt, just feels like, all right, well, we'll just kind of get under the hood, under James Bond hood and do a little tinkering, yeah. fix all that brainwashing and send him out on a mission like nothing happened. And I'm like, Okay, and I and to Calvin's point, I completely agree. Especially coming off of "You Only Live Twice," where I mean, Earth's Earth moving things were left on unanswered at the end of that book. It, it almost felt like like this one almost feels like it could have been better. Like if Fleming was feeling like writing this kind of a story, I think you could have even sort of tinkered with the timeline and sort of done it as a throwback. Maybe this is like yeah. an addition that happened earlier on before all the big stuff. It, it feels like he's trying to get back to just simpler times. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of started off a little underwhelmed and, and yeah. quite frankly, I felt like the whole plexiglass scene had me thinking more get smart than James Bond. <laughs> oh yes, yes, that's right. right. All they needed was uh, uh, Jaime the robot or something yeah. like that to show up. The and cone of silence. The cone of silence, <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, Buck Henry probably wrote the, the second draft, not the first. But, you know, you've got a good point because one of the things I noticed in You Only Live Twice, the novel, when we were talking about it in the book club, there was Fleming was putting a lot of the movie into that novel. The humor, you know, the, the, the swarminess, the pithiness of Connery was coming through in the character. What I'm finding in this one is the situation with M is very much like a screenplay. But for some reason, and we'll talk about this as we move through the book, I just feel Bond is hollow in this in this book. I, I feel like he doesn't have the pithiness. He's mopey. Of course, he's been brainwashed. I get that. But he's um, even um, Benson had wrote an article. Raymond Benson had wrote an article mm -hmm. that this is the most ro robotic Bond is in any of the novels. He kind of goes yeah. through the motion. You know, he second guesses himself, but he's, he's very sterile. And this is really cool. Damn fool. Idealistic Crusade. So Great, name. Twice. Great name. Great name. Thanks for making me like tongue my twist. What appeals to me <laughs> is that you have Bond grappling with his emotions and standing in the world as in Yolt while being thrown into a live and let die 
Diamonds Are Forever, Adventure. It tries to blend the two types of Bond novel. It does. But like anything, when you blend it, you know, if you blend cigarettes and crackers, it's still going to taste like shit. And I'm not saying this is a bad novel, but blending something together, you've got to really be on your game. And That's a very wasn't. specific example. I really well, like I, that. <laughs> <laughs> and listen, it's a great tobacco and crackers. <laughs> if you want to stay up, but um, it's it's not always good. All right, so Bond is passes with flying colors within a couple sentences. He's now deprogrammed, and he's given a chance to prove his worth as a member of the Double O section following the assassination, and he's sent to Jamaica now. I'm going to pause for a second because this is one, and we're going to we're going to play bingo. This is the novel that everybody says has a lot of repetition, like Fleming was ailing. Uh, maybe he was forgetting what he put in other Bond novels, but Bond's been back to Jamaica several times. Now I took that as not as a repetition, but he loves Jamaica. Maybe he knows he's on his last leg, so he wants to talk about it again. Uh, but he goes after Francisco Pistol Scaramanga, a Cuban assassin who's believed to have killed several British secret agent, agents. He's known as the man with the golden gun because his weapon of choice is a gold-plated Colt 45 revolver, which fires silver, jacketed, solid gold bullets. Roland, we're going to start with you. The description of Scaramanga, and, and we, we always think about Fleming and these wonderful descriptions. What did you think of the description? What do you think about the character? I will say they spoke an awful lot about his sexuality, didn't they? There was an awful lot of focus on that. And uh, I, um, is it true? Uh, Calvin, can you whistle, by the way? Um, <laughs> sorry, I was just like thinking of the tune then. <laughs> Not uh, under this pressure. This pressure. Oh. And mm. that's... No, look, myth busted. There we go. <laughs> that was very good. I think was... every one of us, as we were reading it, though, kind of went... Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, it, that, was, that could have been a TikTok trend. By the he way, was, David, was, David from License to Queer, of, uh, time. David from License to Queer is actually in the chat, and he he had said something like this in one of his posts. It was hysterical, but hopefully he'll weigh in here. That was a crazy line, <laughs> and, and and it's kind of it keeps going back to it. It, it. It's this weird thing. I think he was writing about you know. I don't know. We were all left wondering about, were we all left wondering about uh, Scaramanga's sexuality? I mean, you're going to go and kill a man, but it's like, it's very important to know whether he's straight or gay or whatever. This seems to influence isn't. It was, it was weird. It was a, it was a, a beautifully, deliciously, I think, added so much color to him as a character. And I disagree with you, David. I actually really liked Scaramanga as a bad guy. I actually thought he was... Ooh. I had in my head like Lee Marvin or something like that. He was larger than life and he was clearly compensating for something. And I think maybe that's why Ian Fleming focused on his sexuality so much. It's like, why is this guy so intent on being dominant in every interaction he has? Why does he have to make everyone uh, be afraid of him? What is this obsession with this guy? And I was like, sexual now? I don't know. There's, Fleming had a lot going on behind the scenes that I would wish... I could go and have a couple of martinis and figure out like with his sexuality, with his relationship with women, with this character in particular, it's like some psychotherapy going on here, I think. Well, Roland, unfortunately, this is my live stream and I don't like when people disagree with me. So we're going to say goodbye to Roland <laughs> and we've got the, the other two panelists. Uh, let that be a warning. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. He's amazing. I love this boy. So, <laughs> But 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 Roland, I will say this: the, the the only thing I didn't like about the description because they do they go through so much. He goes through so much painstaking to go into the whole circus and the elephant, and so you really think this is like you know he's he's a little off kilter, but maybe he's got a heart and compassion. And I didn't see that compassion played throughout the rest of the book. He just seemed like this cold, like meh, she meh, like you know, Marge, meh. Well, she. Do, do you know what? One of the things they did in the movie, I think, so well is where Christopher Lee is like, I thought I loved animals, but it turned out I loved killing people more. And I think mm -hmm. that's to me was what I thought in the head. It's like Scaramanga was like, you know, it, he didn't have compassion. He shot the elephant in the, the head and then he was like, I like killing people. And he thought, you know, I'll throw being in a circus, loving animals. Nope, I'm like killing people now. That's that's what I'm into. But I, th I thought he I actually took it differently. I thought he loved that elephant. And then he was mad at the police guy and shot the. Am I, am I wrong? He did yep. shoot the elephant, didn't he? 
he did the, eventually because he was dying and it stood it yeah. did its last trick but calvin what do you think i mean it as as colorful as roland loved him where are you with scaramanga <laughs> I, I, I like him. I feel, uh, to pick up on what Joe said earlier on about contrivances, I feel like a lot of the stuff that you have to buy with him is pure contrivance. That I'm sure we'll get to talking about how he hires Bond as his uh, personal assistant, which is just a bizarre, which is... And actually, Roland, the, the, the uh, edition of the book that I got came with a foreword by William Boyd, and he did talk a little bit in that about um, some of the notes that Kingsley Amos gave um, on the original Fleming manuscript, one of them being that he couldn't understand why Scaramanga would go to this extent to keep Bond around unless it was because he took a fancy to him, which is the only reason I can think of why there is such a sort of a... Oh, you know, that's brilliant. Pointed. I could totally that is see cool. that. Yeah. I don't think it really, like, carries through. I don't think it ever becomes any more than subtext, but it is like, it, yeah, you can sort of hook on to that as a reason for um, why his sexuality is brought up so much in the book, because I completely agree, like, it is, like, I think it's in every other chapter. Um, I, I, I ha always have, like, Sam Elliott in my mind when I'm thinking of him, and I don't think the character even has a moustache or anything like that, but I just imagine him talking with that kind of He does, he has a pencil moustache. Like... Yeah. Oh, he does? Oh, okay, right, yeah. Um, I just imagine that proper, like, old-school gunslinger kind of, um, uh, kind of character. And, and David, I think you mentioned earlier on about him feeling a bit like a henchman, and I have to agree with you yeah. there. It's particularly coming after some of the other, like, Thunderbolt, Bond is, like, saving the world from nuclear annihilation, and all, you know, and here Scaramanga is very much a hired assassin, and I think that a part of the story falters when they try to apply a bigger scheme onto him, and it's all this stuff that I'm sure we're going to get into it about sugar cane and marijuana and there's all russia. these different Ru russia yeah exactly there's this hendrix character who yeah. comes in who seems to be he he's not as uh made he's not as um uh main a character as scaramanga is in the book but he certainly feels like he might be higher hierarchy wise above um scaramanga so that's unusual but there are some scenes when he meets bond at the three and a half um place mm -hmm. i love and a half that scene so much yes. oh my gosh I that and that was that. pure fleming because fleming in in his best books he uses nature and animals you know any person that kills or destroys nature like the birds obviously that were eating the the cakes um is is immediately a bad guy you know you just mm -hmm. feel for that and that fleming was so into that so i feel like we were getting these wonderful bursts of fleming um and then and then it would sort of just wane but joe i mean i don't know i haven't seen your t-shirt that says i love scaramanga but what do you think Maybe they you have do. those yeah on sale I, today <laughs> <laughs> I, I i tell you I, you know yeah i really did feel and again i this was I, I feel like the first time i read it there were like two takeaways that i had one was again my my get smart remark of the opening and the other one was Scaramanga. And I just always, I just felt like he was such a paper thin character from, from the get go. I mean, I mean, to me, he, you know, I, I guess in the fifties, a cowboy would be very interesting, particularly again, if you, if you, were, if you grew up in the UK and you're looking at Westerns coming from America, you might think, wow, that's kind of interesting and exotic. And, and I'll play with that. As somebody, you know, was growing up in the modern, an American growing up in the modern age, to me, it's one of the most least interesting things. I, I, I mean, it's so opposite of James Bond that I'm looking for. And I remember feeling like not. It, it's bad enough that he's a cowboy, but I kind of felt like he, he seems more like a pretend cowboy, like a movie cowboy than an actual. Like I, 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 I imagine a, a, a child dressing up as a cowboy with, with the gun belt, with the two six shooters in, in each in each thing. And I'm and I, 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 almost like I can see the cowboy waving on on um, um, in Las Vegas, you know, on, on, outside the old casino. Um, so yeah, I always I I felt and again this time around I felt even more so, just so strange how how they meet um, the, the 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 attempt to be so over dramatic where he pulled like the woman's feeding the two birds and he has to pull the gun out and shoot two birds just just because. Look at me! I'm a meanie head. I'm a jerk, 
And a and, meanie head. Watch the language. There are kids. <laughs> you know, like check. Like if you haven't figured it out, I'm a villain. I do villainous things. I, I'm I'm mean just to, for the sake of being mean. So yeah, I, it was really underwhelming. And 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 honestly, and then, and then when he pulls James Bond in, I kind of felt like the things we're sort of talking about. We needed more. Like why why would he hire James Bond, a guy he doesn't know? Doesn't trust from the the whole entire time. It's like, are you up to no good, guy? I'm gonna get you, you know. And I, it's, I'm like, well, then why you have him around? So I kind of felt like you needed something early on to sort of suggest he either, like, maybe he knows all along that this is James Bond, so he's playing. They're playing each other. You know what I mean? Yeah. There doesn't seem to be any of that. Um, plus, I kind of feel like James Bond doesn't have any real incentive to work for him because the, the guy is clearly a bad guy. Clearly it's not going to end well. If I'm James Bond, you know, and if, and if I'm legitimately just going to work for this guy, I don't see any, any motivation for him to do that. Um, so, so it's like, I, I really wanted more to grab onto here. Like there was, there really wasn't much happening. Yeah. Um, so, and, and nobody, and because of that, nobody seems very believable. So it was very hard for me to, to really take it very seriously. And yeah. And this is where even in the introduction and I do, I actually do like that scene because it seemed very Fleming, but then I was riding on the tropes and look, I mean, obviously this live stream means that I wave the Fleming flag and I really love him as an author, but I just felt like he was, I kept, all right. Here we go. Full confession. When I was reading this, I knew that this was his death book. This was his last book that he died before it was finished. And all I kept thinking was he's so sick and he's so out of it. And he was really ailing with multiple things. Did he just start thinking like in superlative terms, like you're talking about, Joe, the gangster that's big, larger than life, the cowboy that's bigger than life? Um, hey, here's a crazy idea that I just thought of. Let's have uh, let's have a Goldfinger situation where Bond is hired as a secretary and an organizer again. Like, did he forget that he already did that? Did he forget that he did a hoods thing? And I know this. Look, I'm not inventing this. The novel gets a lot of dings because it does seem like he's just taking from his other novels yeah. and he's just kind of serving it up. And I think Scaramanga is a little bit of a bad guy that is a dog's breakfast. And I'm being harsh and I'm sorry, but of other bad guys, but in henchman form. And I think it comes up weak. Roland, I, tell I, me I was, I'm wrong. I was going to say, yet I think it's important. Are you having fun, by the way? I'm having a lot of fun. <laughs> All right, good. I just want to make sure. <laughs> um, I, I think when you're writing, you um, you channel a lot of stuff that you don't even ch realize you're channeling. And if you think of it from a different perspective, I mean, imagine you are in the, the footsteps of, uh, imagine you're James Bond right now, and you have just come back from Russia, and you've been brainwashed, and you tried to kill your boss, who you basically love like a mother, because she's called M, when Ian Fleming called his mother M and you need to prove yourself again, and you're going up against the deadliest man ever. And for me, I don't know if you've ever been in this situation, especially like it's kind of like a, ma a masculine situation where you're in a situation where there is somebody dangerous facing off against you. And you do this little dance and you're like, you're like this person, I don't know if you've ever been in a pub. I like for me, I grew up ginger. So I was in a pubs all the time and people come up and be like making fun of me and, and creating confrontations. And it's the interesting confrontation when you're facing off against somebody and it could slip into violence or you could slip into almost like friendship. As Calvin said, there's this weird thing of maybe Scaramanga's like fancies bond. And I, I, to me, I actually kind of got like this uh this emotional thread of imagining myself in bond situation where he's like i have to get one up on this other guy and this other guy he's like brash and american and in your face and he's got for me as an englishman moving to america it's always really intimidating the way new yorkers especially are in your face and they speak loudly and they speak angrily no we don't <laughs> but as a british person i'm quite reserved and it's like kind of an alien thing to have someone so in your face but at the same time you don't want to lose face yourself and i got a lot of this like back to uh this byplay this like masculine posturing in the story that i think people don't give enough credit to 
that it, it all comes down Fair. to Scaramanga Fair. and Bond playing this elegant game of chess until it all disappears into the, the, the gunfight at the end. You know what sucks is that I control the comments that go in here, and all I've been doing is pulling in people that support my defense. That's awful, <laughs> Roland. I would unfriend me in two seconds. Uh, it's just awful. All right, let's 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 get into something a little bit deeper because um, look, Bond. There is a part that I really like in here, and that is the Mark Hazard. Bond becomes Mark Hazard. Uh, you know, he learns that there's hotel development, there's burning of crops, which by the way, these things actually happened. I love the fact that this is pure Fleming. Fleming will use real life friends, names, events, even the train scene, you know, where someone gets dragged, that actually happened. And so that's why Fleming, if you notice, he puts train scenes in a lot of his books and it's always around death because Fleming, especially towards his later years, saw trains as death mobiles, basically. In fact, um, some of the Golden Eye folks had said that he would never take a train. He would rather walk than take a train. So he himself saw them as basically just, you know, streams of, of death. But I'm going to bring something back to Calvin. And Calvin, I'd love you to comment on this. Roland, you got to tell your kids you got a live stream going here. <laughs> we all either got rid of our kids or didn't have any. And so you can pony up here. No, no, no. It's fine. Let him talk. <laughs> Dad, the garbage needs to be taken out. <laughs> Who's the Scaramanga? Is that one of your... Come on, say hi. Say hi. You hi. Say hi I did not mean that. My bad. Right, right. right. Hi. I there didn't mean is. that. Okay. Eating apple? What's he eating? <laughs> He's eating a pear. It's actually a Danju pear. But I know. I was going to ask what, the, what this was. That's with a bougie the, uh, pear. That is a bougie pear. You're obviously... Oh, there you are drinking funny. your bourbon with your, your, your coffee beans and whatever, and you're calling me bougie? <laughs> I know. I'm We're a bougie crazy. bunch. By the way, this is what friends do. We take the mickey out of each other. By the way, all right, so Calvin, please control this, like like the train going <laughs> off of a, of, a, of a bridge. Like this, Like this is going right now. All of a sudden... <laughs> You got this great story with Mark Hazard. You got all these things. And then suddenly I felt like Fleming just fell over and started typing really quick around, like you said, hotels, uh, burning of crops, sugar, Russia. You know, was it was it too much? Was he was he doing a kitchen sink move? Oh, 100 percent too much. Like. Even right now, I finished reading this book this morning. It I, I read it over about like five days, um, short space of time for me <laughs> reading a book. I can't tell you what the main villain plot is. <laughs> it was like all of these various different things, and there was something about burning the sugar cane, and that came up a few times. I know not to uh, like chew on raw sugar cane anyway, because apparently that makes your teeth like little cat teeth or something. It's yeah. Um, no, I I think that it really does. As soon as they get to the hotel. And until they leave the hotel, I'm a bit lost, really, at all of the various things that are going on. It seems that people are coming and going out of hotel rooms. There's a lot of really suspicious stuff going on. And yeah. everyone's just kind of, eh, okay, Felix is there, the CIA are there, and then this is the first time that Felix has been in um, a, a Bond novel since, I think, Thunderball. Correct me if I'm wrong, guys, you might know this better than me, but I think it, it, there was, like, a couple of... Um, novels uh, of his absence and then he's back now and you think that this would be a big kind of reunion moment but he's just kind of there in the background until he can provide a bit of service later on so and in a way that takes away from Bond's mission because the CIA are already kind of closing in and it seems like they've already got so much under control anyway uh yeah. Uh, so, so no, I think it gets very muddled. The fact that we're hearing most of this, like, Bond is waiting outside the room and putting a glass to the thing to hear it, and there's just entire chapters of what he's hearing. It's just not the most engaging or exciting ways. And I think that's a shame, because I think that Fleming really relishes talking about the villain's plots and all of the machinations and, and that sort of thing. And those are some of the best passages in, I think, some of his other books, where it is just talking about the evil schemes. Yeah. And here, I, I don't think he could quite anchor it down onto one concrete thing, which is why we have a bit of a hodgepodge. And we here's the problem. We know what good looks like. So in Honor Majesty's Secret Service, Fleming goes on for days about poisoning chickens and things mm -hmm. like that. But when he... 
many, many pages. So you really get this incredibly colorful, maybe sometimes too much understanding of the plot and, and the connection. Here, it's almost like, well, sugarcane burning is not enough. So let me throw this. Yeah. But I mean, Joe, I, I may be being sensitive to it, but it just felt like we were being bombarded. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree. And I, I felt like, I felt that that was phlegm. And, and again, you know, we've said it several times that, that he was not in the best health. And, and again, this is only his first go around. But I, I, I was feeling like Fleming was relying on, he knows that his strength is his knowledge of these kinds of plots because he knows a lot about politics and, and international plots and, and, and the kind of crime that, that occurs. So there is a lot of that here. But yeah, it does just sort of feel like I just kind of th throwing it all up at you. You know, I mean, honestly, when this whole section started, I remember it. And David, um, you guys probably all kind of know this feeling. I said to myself, are we, are we really going to go into a hotel conference room? I can't think of anything more <laughs> soul sucking than that. If you oh, come on, we can all relate, though. Alex Lama said it. that. He said, if, he said, you know, act two, setting up chairs and serving drinks for a real estate zoning meeting. <laughs> right? Uh, good Lord. I mean, you, it's almost like you could just, you know, the bad food and the bad coffee that's sitting on the table right over here. We've all been there. And the fact that, the fact that I'm listening to, to much of this, Bond is listening through a glass in the next room. It really just felt like, yeah, this is Fleming's time to just regurgitate a lot of information about stuff, and and I frankly, yeah, I, I was, I'm like, am I, am I a little slow with it for that I can't follow yeah. this? It just felt like a lot to try to dissect and 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 rearrange in your brain to, to try to make any sense, and I wasn't really, um, and plus, honestly. The one there's like Bond first puts the ear out, and then all of a sudden Scaramanga busts in. Are you listening? And, <laughs> And then he goes away. All right, all right I'm watching you. And he watches you. I'm watching you. What's going on? Yeah, right. Yeah. I'm just like, like, come on. Like, really? Oh, so yeah. Again, kind of really underwhelmed at, at this point. All right. But here's the good news. I've got good news for everybody watching here. Um, Roland was visited by the ghost of Fleming last night, and he's been infused, and he's going to defend, you know, comments like Michael Foster, who says this book feels like an Ian Fleming mixtape. That's a good uh, one. <laughs> Roland, come on, save this. This, this, this. It's not a mixtape, is it? I think when it comes to the the oh. craft of writing a book, what happens is you an idea pops in your head and a concept and so for like when i wrote my stupid book here high point i was like oh i want them to all pile and bought this By the old way, boat. very well positioned very well i know, positioned. I know that what that was quite i actually i wanted to have there we go there is that's kim not Shower's, your book no this is kim shower's book testament but it was wonderful and i just finished reading it so by the way go. is she the nicest person and by the way does she absolutely love you or what did you see the post she did for you today Oh, well, I'm uh, uh, that book was amazing. That book made water come out of my eyes. There we go. Um, really? Yes. So was it tears I, or? Oh, yes, yes, tears. That's an excretion. Was... Oh, okay, good. <laughs> no, that's good. I didn't know. Well, joke's on you. When I catch up for lunch, I'm going to give you this copy. So there we go. Right. I'll um, be okay if, as long as I'm not weeping blood. You'll, you'll feel <laughs> So, but um, yeah. yeah. So when you come up with an idea for a book, you have a concept. So like for my book, High Point, I was like, oh, they have to get an old boat and go on an adventure. And for I think he was like, oh, yeah, James Bond needs to renew himself. He needs to, to have this this man -oh man battle with the deadliest man in the world. So he came up with the concept. And then as a writer, you like you have this concept and you have to then put the foundations in place. And the problem was um, that you know, he, he died before he could put all the foundations in place. But a lot of it when you the first draft you're like okay i'm gonna put some convoluted ridiculous thing like oh i see this this advert in the the galena for three and a half love lane and then it's coincidental that i'm gonna meet scaramanga at three and a half love lane he has all of these stupid coincidences and contrivances and i think the aim is that you iron them out when you do your next edit and he just never got the chance to so i think you have to cut him some slack for that it's like he needed to make this story Fair happen point. and what this story really is is about redemption and it's also about 
really weird masculine tete-a-tete between Scaramanga and him and this like there's uh there's a lot, a lot more sexual tension in there now since Calvin mentioned that maybe Scaramanga like fancied him and Ian Fleming's had some very interesting things there so I think he had a really strong concept for what he wanted his book to be about but he didn't have enough time to bring it together and as Goldfinger shows he wasn't necessarily altogether so good at putting things together in any case yeah and you know you bring up some very extremely valid points because one of the things that I'm, I'm constantly trying to marinate myself in is the fact that this is a first draft it's not a second it's not a third And the books that we've read and love, truly love that he wrote, have been through several, many, many drafts. And that's what we know as Fleming. So, you know, who knows if all of his books have been a bit thin. Um, I do know that it's this one just feels a bit, I don't know, anemic. And I'm sure it's because of that. Um, but let's let's talk about something that Calvin brought up because I, I I do put it in my notes. So Bond discovers that he has an ally who's also working undercover at the half built resort, Felix Leiter, who's been recalled to duty by the CIA. Well, isn't that special? And is working ostensibly as uh, that was the butchering of that word as an electrical engineer while setting up bugs in Scaramanga's meeting room. However, however. They learn that Scaramanga plans to eliminate Bond when the weapon is over. Exactly. It's a barkery. Bond's true identity is confirmed by a KGB agent, and Scaramanga makes new plans to entertain the gangsters and the KGB agent by killing Bond while they are riding a sightseeing train to Marina. However, Bond manages to turn the tables on Scaramanga, and with the help of Lighter, kills most of the conspirators. So I know I'm fast-forwarding, but... We've got to stop for a moment and talk about Felix. And now, Calvin, you you have talked about Felix already, um, kind of out of the blue type moment. But do me a favor. Let's let's play a little bit of game because I want to play a comparison. I mean, there's been some really interesting Felix lighter moments. This one seemed the most like um, uh, Hedelson. The, and any of the books and maybe it's the nursing thing at the end where he's flirting way too much with the nurse moment <laughs> or just even when he's telling bond to you know hey james jump jump <laughs> you know uh but what did you think of the overall was it a character did it feel like felix lighter from the other books where would you put him in relation to the other felix lighters because we do this with actors Oh, no, that's, yeah, no, very good point, actually, Um, because I do really like Bond and Felix's friendship um, throughout the books. I think it's, it's nice seeing or reading Bond with a, you know, a pal and having these informal moments and, you know, talking as friends. It's, it's really nice. Here, I just don't feel like we get enough of that. It feels like their exchanges are very short and quite limited throughout most of this. Um, So it doesn't, uh, you know, hold up to, I think like in like, uh, Diamonds Are Forever, I think some of their interactions there are really nice. Thunderball, I think is another really good one. Um, I agree with you on the David Hedison point as well. There is something very David Hedison-y about him in this one. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it quite, like, like much of this book, I suppose, it doesn't really hold up to the standard of some of the previous, uh, versions that we've seen, but I, I, I like it enough. It's, it's it's super contrived that he's there and with the CIA. And again, as I say, I think his presence more uh, devalues what Bond is doing because it feels like Bond could also just not be here. Yeah. and They'd probably have it all wrapped up. <laughs> That's a really interesting point because I, th- I said at the beginning of this discussion, I felt like this was one of the most flat, I guess I could use that word, and most dour Bonds. So you mm-hmm. think the introduction of Felix, I mean, if you look at like Live and Let Die, the novel, you know, their interaction during that novel was superlative, you know, going to the clubs, the, you know, the jibes. But I just felt like this was still a very flat bond, even in, in the train when the gunfire is going off and the discussion and, you know, leaving Felix in the swamp. It just was this like, I'll, 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 I'll rob from Benson unashamedly a uh, robotic. Um, but Roland, maybe I'm being unkind because I've never written a book and I only do videos. What do you think? Oh, well, first of all, you mentioned Raymond Benson. I love Raymond Benson. Like as a teenager, he was one of the people who really got me into my passion for reading. So way to make him feel old. Um, Nicely done. (laughs) (laughs) 
hadn't thought about that. But um, yeah, he, he was quite robotic. And it's funny, I listened to the audio, I read the, the book and then listened to the audio book narrated by Kenneth Branagh. And Kenneth Branagh like really leaned into Scaramanga played by Clint Eastwood. So he did like a Clint Eastwood impression. Mm. But it's almost like he didn't know what to do with Bond. Bond was so, yeah, robotic, like so just dialed in. And some of the, when you actually hear some of Bond's dialogue that loud, you can't imagine Pierce Brosnan or Sean Connery delivering it because it's kind of like, meh. Yeah, you're right. No, and it's it's something we have to explore because I think Felix could have possibly saved certain aspects of the middle portion of this book. Um, but Joe, you may have had a different experience. I mean, you're a huge Felix Leiter fan. What do you think? I, um, I, I completely agree. I think I think it was very, and, and this might might even be the biggest problem I have with the book is that it's extremely flavorless. You know, all yeah. all um, John Lennon made a great point before. Not enough color. I felt needed more descriptions of meals, drinks, locations, and I couldn't yeah. agree with that more. I, I mean, that's that's the part you know that I'm looking for in this, and I felt like all of the other things. You know, the, the plot contrivances probably could have been if we at least got some of that great, oh, Felix is finally here. Let's go to dinner. Let's order drinks. Let's order a steak and talk about how we, we want it. Talk about how we're going to order our drinks. Talk about all the local color. I mean, we, we went, we, we came back to Jamaica. Let's talk about Jamaica, not just, you know, accents and, and things. Let's talk about why we, you know, what what's good to do here, that kind of stuff. I mean, that's that's really, I think, if there's one part of the book that I find, I shouldn't even use the word unforgivable, because I mean, I, I almost feel like it's kind of sacrilegious to sort of, you know, disparage a Fleming book at all, frankly. But yeah, I, I just felt like, boy, that's really what's missing here is, is all of that good local color, flavor, yeah. et cetera, and and. I really, you know, there's a part toward the end in the climax where Bond kind of gets a little lost and says, oh, I can't wait till this is all over and I can I can be somewhere. And he talked about iced champagne. And yes. I, like, I was like, wow, that's that's pretty weak. And, and, and that like like that's it. Like, I mean, it kind of reminded me, like, where is all that? Like, where's the talk about? And I kind of felt like his comments about iced champagne was so generic. You know, the, like that, I, I want more. I want, uh, you know, like, so yeah, I, I, I kind of felt like that's really where this is lacking. And, and again, here's Felix for the first time in quite a while. How, you know, should be a little bit of a big deal that he's here and there's not much happening yeah. there. And, and I do know that even during its time, when, you know, this, this was released, I think, eight months after his death, this book. <laughs> And the editors, John K. basically said, um, this is going to be missing some of the Fleming, as you say, color. Uh, the champagne in the ice cold flasks with the goblets and things like that and the dripping is right out of Goldfinger when they're talking mm -hmm. about the stone crabs and things like that with the pink champagne. I mean, it's almost like ripped from it. I mean, yeah. again, it's that whole bingo. But there is another factor here that I want to talk about. Um, before we get to, and, and I promise everybody who's watching this, who are like, wow, they're really beating it up. We're going to end because the last like two to three chapters of this book, I think are really good. I think we're all in agreement. So we're going to focus on that. But before we do, let's dwell on Bond for a second. And Jerry, Jerry Manis says it very well. Bond suddenly developed a strong conscience and was hesitant to kill in cold blood. That's literally his job, shades of the hesitancy in The Spy Who Loved Me. But there's a minimum of two, maybe possibly three moments when Bond could kill Scar Scaramanga. Now, this is like people telling me when they refer to a movie, why didn't Bond just kill him in the first 15 minutes? Well, then it would be a 15 minute film. OK, <laughs> nobody would go to it. So I get it. You have to write a book. But Roland, did you feel like this was a very different Bond in this film? And Maybe was it reflective of the writer? And I'm asking you first for a reason where a writer has to have a mirror in front of him with his main characters of what he's going through. And maybe was Fleming having second thoughts about things? I don't know. What do you think? 
Well, first of all, you threw up a comment by Jerry, and Jerry, I've been reading a manuscript that Jerry wrote, which is extremely good. So oh. keep that up. But I think one of the the really interesting things about that is we've almost been ruined by Hollywood with the movies and the tropes and stuff like that. Imagine it from a human perspective of like um, actually being in the the position that James Bond was in, and you know you've got this person you or sent to the kill and then you you've got the chance to go i don't know i i'm reading it i was thinking is it oh <laughs> i'm sorry did you lose me first your your aol is breaking up a little bit <laughs> that's say, say um, that again anyway i okay so if you can hear me i was saying if you imagine if you take the hollywood out of it and take the movie perspectives out of it and think of yourself as a human being where you might possibly have to um kill another person could you do that and it's like it's a big weight and i guess if you're a if you killed 20 people already or whatever but actually killing somebody is kind of a big deal and i think back in the 60s before they had the hollywood thing where you're running around with two guns and shooting everybody the idea of actually ending somebody's life was quite a significant thing and i mean i knew growing growing up on a farm like when i would take the shot out to go and shoot magpies i would feel bad about it because i'm killing a living animal and it's like yeah. that's something that Fleming has mentioned several times is the act of killing somebody is significant and maybe that's why he didn't take the opportunities that he could have done but this is why I love the part when uh Daniel Craig uh makes apple pancakes and cores an apple for a kid I don't know if I want to see that real life moment he to me, I love Bond when he's a ruthless assassin. But to your point, he's evolved. He's been brainwashed. He's had a child. You only yeah. live twice. He's, I mean, think about it. He's almost in the no time to die Daniel Craig moment of living this real life and having these huge monologues where he confesses his love as opposed to doing kick-ass stuff. So I'm with you on that. Um, that wasn't a comment on no time to die anybody at all. Um <laughs> But did you just Joe, say bond bondologues? Did you just make up a word bondologues? Because I like that. Sure, <laughs> it's patented. <laughs> right now. James Bond is having his monologues. That's called the bondologue. I like that bondologue. <laughs> if, well, if, if there's a, a bondola instead of a gondola, then there's definitely a bondologue. <laughs> Hashtag bondologue. I, I did it. I got it. Joe, what do you think? Bond. Um, you know, again, it's 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 not. You think about some of the other books where he was this kind of cold assassin. I think Roland brings up a good point. Maybe he's evolved. You know, maybe he's now thinking like, is this the life that I want? Where, you know, killing somebody, even somebody as as reprehensible as crow killing Scaramanga. Mm. What do you think? Um, yeah, I have no problem with the idea that especially this, again, we're, we're several novels in. Um, I have absolutely no problem with the idea that that you know, James Vaughn, uh, he, he was always the killer with the heart of gold. I mean, you know, he, he and he said all along, um, you know, he didn't like killing, but he did what he had to do. Um, I, I do remember when, when the, when the, the finale comes with him and Scaramanga, I remember feeling like, boy, this is really taking forever. Uh, a lot of talking, um, Scaramanga just saying a lot of stuff. And then when he says, can I say some prayers? And Bond's like, oh, okay. And I'm kind of like, <laughs> I, I, I remember just kind of going like, all right, fine. And but I will say this, and I, and, and I and I, I it's going to sound like kind of a sideways wisecrack, but I but um but I really mean this as a, as sort of a compliment. When when they do that bit where Bond lowers his gun, Scaramanga's hand goes back, and then he comes up with a Derringer. I, I remember saying to myself. That's an '80s action movie cliche, if there ever was one. <laughs> you know, just as the hero's gonna. I'm going to walk away and, 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 and let you whatever just, but as he turns his back, the bad guy takes out a gun. So the hero has to swing around. And I said, that's it's I, I 1964. Said, right. I but said, it I justifies it. Invented this cliche. I, I felt like, you know, like I'm like, I remember saying to myself, for me, this is as, as old school cliche action movies you can get, but this is, was a long time ago. So you have to really give credit where it was due and say, I, I think back then this was, you know, pretty fresh. I I agree. Um, Calvin, what do you think? I mean, kind of 
Bond is the character of cold blooded versus, you know, kind of rethinking and little moments like Joe was talking about. I, I, it's something that I wish was explored more in this story, specifically because the whole point of him being on this mission is M sort of sending him on as like, well, either you die or you sort, you know, killing gets you back into the game. And I, I kind of wish that that was a bit more explored because there are these moments in there. Bond's in a car with Scaramanga. He's behind him at a moment. He says, I could shoot him in the back of the head right now and that would be it. And it's like, yeah, why aren't you doing that? I, I just wish that that was a bit more explored. Perhaps it would have been on a, on a further draft. And to Joe's point about that scene where he does kill Scaramanga, I, I, I wish that it had just been in cold blood. It, it, bothers me slightly that he did have to have Scaramanga come at him with the thing and then uh, it's almost like a self-defense you know kind of act, it's a which, Hollywood cliche isn't it yeah totally exactly. because you don't want your hero you don't want to risk your hero being too unlikable by mm. you know killing someone in cold blood but I feel like so much of this is building to that and it feels like just a bit of a cop out I would have preferred it if Scaramanga, Scaramanga had just finished his prayer and then Bond just shot him or, you know, only let him get halfway through or something. I feel like that that returning to that coldness would have completed the arc, as it were. That's uh, a great point. Like, it, it's almost like he's back. He's fully back. Yeah. You know, the whole thing that, you know, Tanner and Moneypenny were like, oh, that's not him. He is mm. back if he's cold-blooded and know that this is his job. I mean, the whole thing of allowing a prayer just seems mm. so out of sorts and... By the way, I will say this, the um, couple of people are saying, you know, maybe he he invented this particular cliche of, of the bad guy. The one thing that I, I couldn't help but think about when they were going through Bond observing him, it was almost like gorillas in the mist. It's like, why is Bond mm -hmm. sitting in these swamp like things just watching this and the crab and the snake and the eating? It's just like, why don't you just stroll right up or just shoot him? Um but I understand there had to be the tete to tete. Now, here's the problem. And Calvin, we're going to kind of work backwards, mm. even though you just spoke, because I'm going to I'm going to put out a theory. Mm. Here we go. Hold on. Here we go. Oh, that was good. Wow. That was right on cue. I, I've been saving all that like <laughs> air in my knuckles just for that. Joe's trying to get in there and afterwards, but no, yeah, he's going to do it as well as you. <laughs> <laughs> so my theory is some of our favorite parts of this novel, albeit flawed, are in the last portion of it. And yet here we are talking about the very crescendo. So Calvin, what did you like about the last portion of the book? What really stood out to you as a positive? Well, just while we're on this chapter of uh, Bond confronting Scaramanga, while I, I, I take issue with that last moment, like whatever that is, the last page or two, um, when he actually does kill him, I actually love that whole chapter, the build-up where Scaramanga is like wounded in this swamp and the with the snake coming over and then he kills the snake and then he starts eating it and he's throwing bits of it for the crab. Like, I love that. Like, that chapter is just like... And up until this point... There's some fun action on the train, um, and it kind of goes off and it's bridge on the river Kwai moment, as uh, I think Felix puts it in the uh, in the book, which is quite exciting. And there's a bit of a shootout, which is good. But that chapter with Scaramanga, I just think that is for me anyway. That was like a oh wow, this is Fleming like really back at his uh, like just painting a picture of this set of the scenes and i kind of like that bond is taking his time in that moment um again i don't think it fully plays out because of how he ends up killing scaramanga i but i do like that he is kind of having to gear himself up to do this and that reluctancy is kind of uh coming to its end here it's like oh i can't really put this off anymore as i say i don't feel like it's entirely satisfactory how that plays out but um yeah that whole it's so weird he's eating a snake for god's sake it's so bizarre but i love it it's yeah really I, odd i okay so you and i it's really weird yeah Supercato. yeah it is weird I, but i think i'm in total agreement where when i was and and i'll be confessional again uh i did this with audible so i listened mm -hmm. to the book which I really enjoyed and I was able to kind of do things, but still concentrate. But when I was, I stopped doing whatever I was doing to hear these last few chapters because mm. I heard Fleming, mm. like in these last chapters, when you, when you, when you listen to him, write That the head of the snake thudded 
and the crabs didn't come out yet, although they smelled something amazing. And whatever whatever they're smelling sounds great, but the thud scared them off. And, and it's three quarters of a page to talk about a freaking crab not eating a snakehead. That's Fleming. And I thought like the man came out of his shell. Excuse the pun. Um, so I, I'm in agreement with you. But Joe, what what what's redeeming about this last portion? Or, or maybe you were like, you know what? For me, it was thin. I, it's, it's, I mean, it's funny. I'm sitting here like gathering up all my complaints and then you go, so tell me something redeeming. Oh, um, <laughs> no, 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 no. But, but that's the thing. If, if, if it's thin, it's thin. I, you know, we, we can't all share the same opinion. Yeah. I, I, I you know, it, it's funny too. One of the big problems that I have, and I was saying to myself, I wonder if this is something that maybe a lot of the stories do. You know, Bond is so involved in being the character he's playing. He's he's so busy being Mark Hazard that, unfortunately, it, it requires secondary characters like Felix to, to actually do the things that actually save the day. And I, and I do remember kind of feeling like it's mildly frustrating because, honestly, you know, Bond is, you know, on the train in character and then... But thankfully, Felix was on the train the entire time. He replaced Mary Goodnight on the train tracks. And I remember kind of saying to myself, are we, are we really doing this where we tied, some, tied a, a damsel to the train tracks? But <laughs> <he> replaces, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, he replaces her on the track with the dummy and blows up the track. So I'm saying to myself, I, it was almost like this a similar vibe whenever I watched Thunderball. And, and and the guy rescues Domino on and says the bomb now can't be exploded. I threw the detonator into the sea, and I'm saying to myself, I think that guy should be running off with Domino at the end. He <laughs> saved the day while Bond was over here doing the exciting stuff, you know. So all of it, so all of a sudden, Felix just sort of shows up out of nowhere, and, and he saved the day. And and then I, we get to the part where he was dragging Felix into the marsh, and I remember saying to myself. What did I? What did I just miss? Because Bond right. got hit. I remember that. I don't remember Felix getting hit. But now suddenly we, we had to sort of switch roles because Bond has to be the hero, so he's rescuing Felix, and then he has to go off and find Scaramanga for the showdown. So I, I again, I just sort of walked away, going like, "Boy, that was pretty lackluster." And he just sort of found Scaramanga wounded. You know, and and not I, I kind of remember thinking to myself, at the, I would at the very least, how about some sort of confrontation here? And again, I'm saying to myself, well, I mean, again, I, I do enjoy the, the Fleming writing. And it, I mean, it was almost to the point where I was sort of saying to myself so many moments in, in, in this book, I'm saying to myself, I feel like Fleming is writing for the screen again. Hmm. It was and it was almost like. It, it was. I felt like in some ways I was being sort of trained where now my demands from the story are more cinematic. And I'm saying to myself, uh -huh. I think it, maybe now I'm starting to be disappointed at these moments where it's just a lot of talky talk um, where I, I shouldn't be because I should be enjoying the, the you know, the, the, the flavor that's coming out of the writing. So, but yeah, just... Um, what were you asking about high points from it? Well, no, 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 no. But I mean, you've 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 come across. It's like this still didn't redeem itself. So I think there are some that see the last few kind of moments, the swamp. Let's call it the swamp scene as like, oh, there's the Fleming we've been missing. Yeah. You know, um, it, there's there's a really great. I want to put this up here again. You know, DFIC as I call them because too long otherwise. <laughs> Bond can't kill Scaramanga the way he did the robber. The point of the story is that Bond comes to terms with himself and his profession. What keeps him sane is his humanity and personal code of honor. Those are big takeaway moments. My whole thing was I just wanted to hear and smell Fleming's writing. I, yeah. I, I'm a simple person. I'm not the smartest man out there. I just want these Fleming-like writing tropes. Like when I read Roland, you know, I want to hear the wetness of things. And when I see that and hear that, I, I get that out of it. <laughs> By the way, you can use that as a testimony in your next book. Right. Um, but but Roland, Thank you. listen, we just applied Joe's heat. Now let's apply scientifically your ice um, to, to, to kind of come away with this. You must have loved the last portion of this book. 
I, I as I said, it, it's reading this book is like visiting an unfinished house. And you can see he had in his mind, he was like, I'm going to have a showdown between two guys. And he kind of like wrote out the first draft. And you can, and in some ways, the simplicity of it and his, his simplicity of language and his economy of language made it a beautiful because he knew exactly what was going on. The rest of the stuff he had to like figure out and convolute and things. And I almost wonder if he did like ruined the last act by putting all of, in all his Fleming touches, although I don't necessarily think he would have done. But there was something really simple and elegant and beautiful about that final act where it's like two guys going against each other. But I totally agree. You guys fixed the man with the golden gun by saying he should have just shot him cold blooded. But I, th I think one of the interesting things is we come to that with the 2022 perspective. We have spent 60 years watching movies in which, you know, it was Arnold Schwarzenegger action movie and then Bruce Willis action movie. And then we've come to the point where death in movies means nothing to us. Whereas in the 60s, like actually killing somebody had significance. And I think also because people like Ian Fleming had served in the war and worked with people who'd served in the war and, killing people was significant and i think we kind of lose sight of that um when we read it now i think everyone's always about like oh you know ian fleming's his sins about being racist or sexist or whatever a, a sign of his time but also his humanity was a sign of his time whereas i think he had more reverence for human life than we today having been brought up on a hollywood a movie uh diet might actually have and that's why he was stuck in this situation and, and people have been saying he invented the cliche but it's like yeah he invented the cliche of i have to kill this person i don't want to it's against my moral code oh he's pulled out a derringer now i have to kill him in self-defense isn't that nice now i don't have any of the moral weight on that so that's my thought no it's 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 a worthy one and it's it's actually really well thought out because you know one of the things that you're right is you've got to think about and I, sometimes you lose track of this you tend to put it through the, your own filter of your experiences and where you are today. Um, I love reading these books because they're such a wonderful historic point in time. And the morality, you know, the whole, you know, shrugging off, you know, the, the idea of getting, you know, this honor that was bestowed upon him is this sort of humble attitude that I know Fleming believed in. We're going to we're going to turn the coin a little bit. So it's 422. Everybody's hanging in there, having a great time. A lot of drinking going on in the chat room, by the way. It's getting a little rowdy. That's all right. It's a, it, oh, listen, a chat room. It's Saturday. Oh, <laughs> nicely done, sir. Um, but one of the things I want to move to is an interesting question. I thought we'd have a little bit of fun on a Saturday afternoon or evening for Calvin. Um, and then we're going to go back to the book. But I want to dive into the movie. And Calvin, I think you're going to appreciate this question because you and I have waxed poetic about this. We love, not like, love the movie, The Man with the Golden Gun. Is that fair to say? Oh, yes, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So many things. So <laughs> let's take what is impossible not to do and compare the two. Um, given a deserted island scenario, you know, you're going to the Bahamas on a vacation in June 14th to 17th. And uh, they leave you off on an island that is deserted. And they say, look, you can have the novel or you can have the movie. Um, first of all, which Scaramanga do you gravitate to? Which one's more complicated, colorful, more robust? Uh, and why? And what do you what do you connect with? You know, I was I was I finished reading this uh, the, the book earlier on today, and, I, and this question came up into my mind because I was wondering, like, is David going to ask like about comparing the film and the book, and what would I, and even th and even like, then I couldn't say they're such different beasts. It's it, it's. Um, I'm not going to uh, let you get away with that, though. <laughs> <laughs> you know that. I I suppose that I would have to of the Scaramangas, I would have to say that I prefer Christopher Lee in oh. um, Man with the, in, in the film, obviously. Um, it's a very different character what he yeah. does with it, obviously. But um, he's so good in that film; like he's one of the best things in that film. So it's uh, it, it's impossible to imagine it without him. Um, I think that the film uh, it improves on the book in some ways. Uh, you know, just by I mean, it's a very different plot, I, I guess. Um, 
you know, changing the location from Jamaica gives it a certain freshness. Uh, I, I still think it suffers from the problem that you have Scaramanga set up as this amazing assassin character. Uh, but then on top of that, he has to have this larger than life plot about, well, in the film, it's the Solex agitator. And in the book, it's all the sugar cane and marijuana and all that kind of stuff. So I think that they have some uh, similar trappings. Um, uh, I, I, of the two, I guess if I could only live on Earth with one of them, it would be the film. <laughs> but uh, it's a tough, yeah, it, it's a bit of a Sophie's choice to get to that point. Well, I, you're right. I mean, it's, <laughs> this is why <laughs> I like that child better than that child. Um, it, is, uh, it is a tough one because they are so different. I mean, Scaramanga in the movie is kind of Bond's equal. And I think that's what makes it so interesting. He mm. loves the, you know, the fine food, the fine women, all those different tropes. Um, Joe, what about you? I mean, I, I think I know where you're going to go based on the last hour and 25 minutes, but which one are you saving? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would definitely go with the film. And and ironically, it's funny. I, I, I know um, I can remember you and I doing a conversation about Golden Gone um i think we were talking about our sophomore efforts and because this was a second film for roger moore um so and i mentioned there i said you know this is one of the few cases where i really do think and i shouldn't say few because it, it it does happen a lot of ways um on a lot of levels but i clearly think they did step it up for the film um you know i, I obviously saw the film before reading the novel. And when I read the novel, I remember thinking like, wow, they really did take the film. The film to me feels more Fleming than the book does. Because the mm. book, I feel like Fleming is, is instead of going what for me is more exotic, I feel like he's he's kind of going more domestic for me because he's, he's trying to do like an American cowboy. And to me, it just feels so not exotic. If there's, a, if there's another... Whatever the opposite of exotic is, I feel like that's what this Scaramanga is. So I feel like Christopher Lee's portrayal, the way they build up to this mano a mano, you know, my gun versus your gun, um, a, a full blown showdown. Um, I think that's what this film is. That's what this novel is lacking. I feel like, you know, the build up to the great Scaramanga, you know, best shot, you know, in the world, best assassin in the world. You know, for for the, the two of them to just sort of limp into the mud and and talk and 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 eventually one shoots the other, I don't know. I kind of feel like there there was this big showdown that was meant to happen. It doesn't happen here. Um, so yeah, I, I really do. Um, as much as I've often called Golden Gun very kind of mediocre, not great, not terrible, not anything. Um, and that's been Joe Darlington from uh, Being James Bond. We'll have to say goodbye to him, but uh, what a great guy. Make sure to check out his channel. I'm sorry. That was that terrible. That son of a... Oh, oh, hey, guys. <laughs> I love StreamYard. <laughs> no, but Joe, Joe, honestly, you've, you've encapsulated something that is so important. I didn't even think to bring up. I love the bond franchise because it allows me to escape from the stresses of my day and it it catapults me into different locations with exotic people this book didn't feel that way even though they were in jamaica it wound up in a swamp yeah. <laughs> and and i'm happy to say i've not toured the swamps of jamaica i'm sure they're lovely yeah um but between, between hotel conference rooms and swamps yeah, and, and that's what people wanted in the 50s and 60s from Fleming is take me away, although they did have the movies at the time. Now, Roland, you have a chance, not to phone a friend, you have a chance to uh, talk to us because maybe based on the last four, uh, you know, hour and 29 minutes, maybe you're going to gravitate towards a different place than the movie as you drain your sixth beer and freeze <laughs> with your dial. Am I still freezing? Am I waving? Yeah, Hi. every now and then, every now and then. But it's crystal clear, your resolution. Look at that. <laughs> Lovely. Well, look, okay. I, I, I had the problem that The Man with the Golden Gun was the first James Bond film I watched. And it oh. is etched into my brain. 
Like for some reason we had it on VHS cassette in the eighties, and I mean Britt Eklund in a bikini is when I'm like, oh, I'm heterosexual apparently, <laughs> and uh, it, it it's um, Chris Lee just is wonderful in anything he does. I'm watching the, the Star Wars films and like uh, Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith and like he's Count Dooku, he's Scaramanga, he's he's uh, everyone. He's just amazing as a villain. So it's difficult. The, the movie is just this wonderful piece of history where they have the Queen Mary on its side and M's office inside there. It's just a wonderful, wonderful movie. And the, the book is completely separate to that, I think. So, you know, if I had to pick one, I'd pick the movie. But that the movie was like wow. what got me into Bond in the first place. Whereas the book I love because I do, I do still like, and it's in the movie as well, this kind of like this tete-a-tete, uh, two men against each other. And the book... James Bond is very much intimidated by Scaramanga, whereas the movie Scaramanga is obsessed with Bond. But there is this always this obsession, as Calvin said, it's maybe it's not it, maybe it's there's more to this obsession, but there is this obsession between the two. This kind of like one has to copy the other. It's um, I don't know if you wrote fan fiction, you write, I'd ship it, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. But I I I love that and I, unexpected. By the way, I, but your your first Bond movie is uh, I hate to say it, it's like kind of like your first love. I mean, it's hard to forget and it's you know hard to walk away from. Here's what I'd like everybody to do. What happened to you um, and your first love? If it was hard to walk away from, <laughs> I, I actually don't think I've walked away from it. <laughs> She's in the other room making uh, barbecue answer. chicken right now. <laughs> Smells good too. Um, <laughs> Boy, 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 did I diss my other girlfriends. Um, so anyway, that's not what this is about, Roland. Don't bring out the best of me. Um, I would like everybody in the chat. Let me concentrate, will you? I, I'd like everybody in the chat to do something. From a, For those who have read the novel, not everybody has who's in the chat. Everybody who's read the novel, we're going to rate this novel one to five. One being the worst of Fleming's novels so don't do it upon like how you feel it's in the in the range of fleming novels because we're going to be moving off to the short stories soon but fleming novels one to five five being the absolute best novel that he's ever written one being the absolute worst um <laughs> somebody hold on a second martin says oh david you old smoothie no that's being 54 <laughs> knowing how to survive survive <laughs> Because these things are public. Joe gives me a thumbs up. Um, tell me what you say. So we've got uh, Daniel saying 2.5. Mark, 3. 3.5. Wow, Morgan. Tough. Tim Hans gave it a 5 out of 10. Didn't understand the uh, the job and the mission. Yeah, so this is out, out of 5. five. <laughs> Get um, it together, man. <laughs> maybe score that again. Uh, Josh. Josh Ferguson. And we got a 1.5. We've got Corey. We've got, wow, we've got a lot of threes. So we're hitting middles and lows. One, but not a fair comparison. I'm sorry. He wrote all the books. Uh, Michael, oh, wow, this one's complicated. Michael Foster gave it a 3.4567. Obviously an accountant. Obviously an accountant. Uh, Gavin gave it a 2.5. We've got Neil who gave it a 1.6. Um, we've got a three. I'm not seeing any fours. I'm not seeing any fives. I will give it a solid three, says Create Channel. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. As we do that, I'm going to go to our panelists. Uh, Joe, I want you to go first. Uh, again, just like everybody else, one out of five. Um, yeah, I'll be the bad guy. I'll, I'll, say, I'll say specifically, again, you know, I whenever I do, rate Bond movies, I always score them, you know, it goes without saying that a bad Bond movie is still ten times better than than pizza and sex. Pizza and go. sex, they're not exactly. bad ever. So, but when I when I rank them, I always say, well, something's got to be the be a be the worst one. I mean, something has to be my least favorite. Um, similarly, here I will say that this one I'll score it a one. Quite frankly, I think that compared to other Fleming works, I I feel like this is probably my least favorite of the novels. Um, with that said, for all the reasons we said, it's an unfinished book. I totally feel like Fleming was, was probably 
very ready to just give it one, you know, get it all out on paper, go back, polish things, add in more of that flavor that we love so much. Um, but at the end of the day, you have to score it based on the final product, not not what could have been. And, and you know, um, certainly acknowledging all the reasons we talked about. But if, if I'm going to just talk about the final product, I got to give it a one. All right. Wow. Tough. Joe, Joe's a tough man. You, you, you know, he, he always introduces himself on his podcast. It's your good pal, friend, head of section beat. And he could be tough. I'm telling you, he could be ruthless. I like that, though. We should have had Bond like that. Uh, Roland, one through five, where are you giving? I, I think I'm going to give it a three. I mean, I'm not really into giving bad reviews of anything, but it's like... Nice. You no, know, it. it there are books, there are James books that mean incredible, like Casino Royale, Majesty Sea Service. They're just like books that are so deeply meaningful. Um, and then you have books that, that have flaws that are still meaningful, like Goldfinger. I would say Man from the Golden Gun, where the man with the Golden Gun is better than Goldfinger. I think it's all the Fleming gun is strong. So I give it a three. Okay. That's, wow. that's a solid silent. score. I think that's a, did I get disconnected or were you just like trying to react to you? You were, you were breaking up. You were a mixture of uh, Max Hedrum and an uh, SOS, like, you know, did, 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 did. yeah, but I got it. I heard, I heard. Oh, okay. Well, let me say that again. <laughs> I think if you scream, you know, okay. So look. better better wi-fi connection <laughs> well let me scream then i was going to say that yeah in terms of all the bond books you have on a magic service you have casino royale they are perfect and then you have books like goldfinger which have so much of the evocative stuff that we love about fleming however i think the man with a golden gun structurally is better than goldfinger just from the structure of storytelling and so i would give it a three out of five and we heard every word of that. So that was the right move on your part. It worked. <laughs> Who knew? So listen, when you upgrade your dish network, I would go for the uh, the, the big. I'm thing. in New Jersey. I'm not. I'm, excuse me. You're in Pennsylvania. I'm sure it's all down to you. Your governor <laughs> needs to upgrade your Wi-Fi. If listen, no, if you dial into this and you hear, <laughs> just upgrade. <laughs> Uh, we're trying to upgrade our governor, but we know. <laughs> oh, wow. I said no politics on this damn thing. <laughs> I said that. Look Calvin. at Joe drinking water quietly. <laughs> Calvin, we've got a one and we've got a three. What are you going for? I know. I guess I'm going to come down the middle there and give it a two. The crucial thing that you said, David, was com giving it this rating uh, compared to the other Flemings. Because when you first said yes. a rating, I was thinking, like, I'd give it a three if I was just rating it as any book. Yeah. Um, comparing it to the other Flemings, I had to have a look over at the collection here because I was like, where do I place it? Like, uh, there's some that I uh, dislike more. And yeah, like, I think... I, I probably like it more than certainly The Spy Who Loved Me. I like it more than I think Diamonds Are Forever. Um, so I, I think that just nudges it up um, a little bit. But I feel like that's doing a bit of a disservice to it, really. Because as I say, I feel like I had a more positive response to it this second time around. Okay. Um, it, it, it's just that, yeah, as Roland said, it's like compared to some of the stuff that I, I think is just like, like I think Majesty's Secret Service is Fleming's masterpiece. I think that's just an absolutely magical book. Um, Moonraker, You Only Live Twice, I love. Um, there's yes. so much good stuff there. So it's just, it, it, it just can't go any higher than two for me, I guess. You have yeah. to pick a side now, Calvin, though. You can't do two. <laughs> you have to be like one or three. Come on. <laughs> two is a perfectly valid number it, well and, and here's what I'm, I'm scared about rolling with is he, you know, he's driving distance from my house i'm <laughs> house, i think he can't drive to the uk and beat you up but he can come here and he's got swords he's got i've I, seen I, you I, with nunchucks though i think you could have me I, I can maybe hold my own for like five seconds then you're gonna cut me up i will cut you um but i would That's also a youtube video right there good there's so many um, I'm going to go with two also, and and it's not. 
I'll tell you why. And Joe, I was like vacillating between one because I'm hard pressed to think of another one where I closed the book and I was just like, oh, the first thought that came to my mind. And this is just, you know, because of social media and how we're like wired today. I, I closed the book and I'm like, oh, what's this live stream going to be like? I didn't even think like, what was the satisfaction or dissatisfaction I have of reading a book for like the last week and a half on my way to and from work, which I, by the way, I enjoyed this. But if you, Calvin, you put it perfectly. If you compare it to some of the other ones where, you know, even Dr. No with the 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 batshit crazy like squid and things like that. I just loved, I, I was drinking everything up. I'm like, oh my gosh, what is Fleming going to throw up? And Fleming is and was an, a, a literature athlete, you know, muscles galore. And he threw these books at us that we were just, I would close the book when I was done with a chapter. And I was like, do I really have to go do work or do I have to go eat dinner? Like, I really, I'm like, and with this book, I was just like, I need to get through it. Like, you know, okay, he's going to do the swamp thing. Now he's doing a whole thing in the hospital. Now he's doing a whole thing with, you know, Mary Goodnight, you know, wanting to take her back to the house. Okay. Is that the end? Oh, I guess that's the end. Like, I don't know. Honestly, it was almost chore-like. So if I could give it a one and a half, I would. But if I'm following my own rules, I'll give it a two just to honor Fleming himself. Which books did you like less, David? I'm curious, because now that you've sort of come almost to the end of this whole run through, are there any that you would rate below this one? Yeah, I, I you know, for some reason, I don't know why, because it had some good Fleming moments. Diamonds are forever. Hmm. For some reason, it just didn't connect with me. And hmm. I don't know if it was, you know, for some reason, uh, and it could be that Schenectady is like in my backyard, practically. But it just didn't feel Bondish, and and mm -hmm. Calvin, you said this. Sometimes when Bond takes place in your backyard, it doesn't feel like you're escaping, even yeah. when it's the movies. So, uh, what what about for you? Like, which ones, you know, which ones were hovering right there? Uh, definitely, Diamonds Are Forever and um, Spy Who Loved Me as well. I'm not a fan mm. of that one. Um, uh, I I think I might even agree with Roland on the Goldfinger. Uh, point as well. That, I don't remember being very keen on that, but um, that might be it. It's in there. It's in the bottom four, I guess. Is by the way, even up. even um, some of the short stories like Quantum of Solace, I found were mm -hmm. an interesting reflection of Fleming and his relationships. So mm -hmm. to that, I found complete enjoyment. It wasn't didn't feel like a Bond a Bond novel. I mean, sorry, a Bond story. But to me, it was very satisfying and it was very well written and very specific and it felt Fleming. Mm. But, um, well, let's let's go around. I mean, I love that you started this, Calvin. Joe, you know, which which ones were even worse if there was a worse or is this the bottom of the barrel? I, I think this one is the bottom for me. It's funny. Honestly, I, I really did feel like, uh, yeah, I think this is it. I, I, you know, I, Diamonds was clunky for me it wasn't great it, it, i mean i'm sitting here kind of go like looking at the other ones and sort of trying to you know refresh my memory i i i think i even like this by alumni better than this and most people don't like it at all i i kind of found the last time i read it i was like I, I think i'm enjoying this one um yeah honestly i think all of them work much better and i mean honestly it's funny as i'm picking on this one and giving it a one i was sort of going in my head thinking of the other ones and i'm thinking like the other ones for me are like four, five, four, five. Know. You know, like all of them are pretty top notch. Yeah, I think I think this one's got to be the bottom of the barrel for me. Even the short stories, like you said, the ones that kind of go off the reservation a little bit. I usually, I mean, honestly, I f I feel like after reading this one, and and by the way, I remember even after the demise of Scaramanga, I remember kind of looking and going. There's still two more chapters? Good Lord. Can we get done with this? <laughs> I, I was really... It's like I, Lord of the Rings. There's like multiple endings. <laughs> totally. And then I even, even when I finished it, I remember, and I read it before, so I kind of remembered. I, I remember even as I was reading it this time around, when they were jumping off of the train into the marsh, I remember going, oh, yeah, that's right. That's what's coming. And I you know went through it. I might have zoned out a little bit. So even when I finished it, I kind of went, Wait a minute! Did I did I totally zone out when the, when Scaramanga got bumped off? So I had to go back and read that part again, and I remember kind of being annoyed that I had to do that. 
honestly, finishing this, I feel like, and now that we're talking about it, I really want to go back and, and read other Fleming now to sort of like, as sort of a palate cleanser. Yeah, it's a good point because, I mean, this is really tough because, and I'm sure I'm jaded because I'm a Bond fan, but my favorite books are Fleming. I mean, they just are because it is Bond. And mm-hmm. but I also just genuinely like the, uh, you know, call it quirkiness of, of Fleming's writing. I know he's not, you know, Tolstoy or I get it. Um, and he, it's, it's almost pulpy. And I get that, too. But there's just something just so embracing when I read him. Uh, but Roland, I mean, you know, you gave it a three, which does mean ergo and vis-a-vis. And we should ask that gentleman who's an accountant who gave it a 2.3549. Um, <laughs> there are ones that are lesser. Which ones fall under the grade of uh, the Golden Gun? It's it's all down to structure. Structure is the most important thing. You said you read a book and you feel satisfied afterwards. And yeah. that's because it's a story. The old tradition in human history. Like we, as K, we gather around a campfire and tell stories. And stories follow a circle. And a good story has a satisfying ending. And Fleming was a journalist. So he was very good at reporting what was happening. And he would explain what was happening with the most beautiful economy of words and the use of metaphors. But when it came to the structure of storytelling, he was always weak. And so I think this had a pretty strong structure and he left kind of satisfied. And it's like Goldfinger had certain elements to it. And Goldfinger and Diamonds of Forever are two of my favorite books because I came to America when I was 22 years old seeking adventure so inspired by everything that i'd read like and so to me like diners and shenectady and upstate new york and stuff like that they're magical to me so these little elements from these books are great but in terms of their structure they're lacking and when he got the structure right ian fleming was just amazing and when he didn't focus on the structure he had beautiful elements in his books but they didn't leave you satisfied and it's funny we got kim Sherwood's book here one of the things finishing that book it was satisfying because it had a twist in the end that was a twist you kind of you didn't expect but made perfect sense and i think ian fleming at his best has these stories that twist at the end and they're satisfying um and and that's why i think this one kind of stands out against the others in terms of just that that structure structure to me is the most important thing of all storytelling so you're not going to answer my question no, absolutely not. But, Which but that was very one profound. That was is, quite nice to listen to. It was beautiful, <laughs> and I'm sure it'll turn into a uh, you know some sort of like stories on my Instagram. But uh, which one falls under this one? Which one would you jettison in, in, in place of this one? I would say Goldfinger. Goldfinger is both my best and my worst book yeah. because I love love Goldfinger for all of the lifestyle moments and stuff like that. It's some of his most beautiful writing, but in terms of the plot, it just completely falls apart. It's ridiculous. And the movie corrected it. So yeah, Goldfinger, especially to me is, is lower in this. Uh, and um, you only live twice, never quite gelled with me in the same way, but I don't know. So maybe I put those two down there, but you know, it's, it's a three because it was an attempt. An attempt was yeah. made and then he died, which to be honest, you can't hold I against know, him. I know, but here's the crazy part. Um, and there's been a lot of questions I see coming up because people are sensing the end of the live stream. Um, good sense, by the way. So uh, the reality is, is we're not ending this. Um, uh, the, the James Bond book club will return with Octopussy and the Living Daylights. We cannot forget that. And you know, it's a really interesting story of capitalizing on Fleming's popularity in the movies, you know, taking these two portions and cobbling together. And we're going to be talking uh, uh, that and even continuing on beyond that. So uh, for those that are a little 
uh, I won't say freaked out, but concerned in the chat room that this is going to end. Uh, no, it's 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 like, uh, you know, the Godfather. You know, as soon as I think I'm out, they pull me back in. I can't do that guy. I can't do him at all. But um, I do want to thank my incredible guests. Calvin, where can people find you if they want to see you beyond this? Oh, you can find me on YouTube if you just type Calvin Dyson. That should uh, direct you to my channel. And um, yeah, that's probably the best way to find me. And Calvin has an amazing, and I I will say this, he's going to be way too humble, uh, breakdown of No Time to Die that's actually longer than No Time to Die. <laughs> <laughs> almost, yeah. almost. It's longer than about half the Bond films, which I don't quite know how that happened. But um, yeah. yeah. And he's don't be a weenie. Watch the whole thing. Don't go to the bathroom in the middle. <laughs> don't be a don't be a, a meanie like Joe says. Joe, <laughs> are your good friend, head of section, being James Bond, who I love this. I saw like a darker side today, and then he turned happy again, which I never <laughs> like. But Joe, where can people find you? These days at work. That's about it. No, I uh, know. Wait, are you are you coming back? Are you going to start doing more podcasts and stuff? Yes, absolutely. In fact, I I, I have to listen to the one that you did, uh, kind of lament lamenting some of the lost uh, uh, podcasts. Uh, yeah, no, no. I, I you know I'm, I'm you know we need you back. I never left. That's the way. I, that's the way I look at it. And never real, never really too far away. And I'll always be you know kind of even even if I need to take a time out, I'm I'm always in the wings. Um, you know, so so definitely more stuff soon. I, I have some things that are percolating in my head that I kind of want to get out there soon. So, yeah, we'll be we'll we'll definitely be back with some more stuff. I mean, people will herald your return. That's all I have to say. <laughs> and Mr. Roland, I know that you've got either a book or a discussion, but you're prolific on YouTube and Instagram. You're making best friends with uh, official Bond authors. Uh, but what's where can people find you, and what's next in your horizon? Um, well, I mean, I write under her name, Simone Scarlett. This is the last book I wrote. Look at that cover. Design that. This is David Zaritsky's abdomen. <laughs> there we go. But um, I worked hard for that. And cool. I, I'm probably the first thing that pops up. You did. We're going to start a GoFundMe for um, <laughs> Roland's uh, upgrade in his Wi-Fi. Uh, you can go to www.staticcling.com. And if you go there, you'll find Roland's. Oh, there he is. Okay. Now you're clear. Now say that all over again. Well, you know, you're just frozen. Yeah. There I was making fun of apps and... and I'm just. Is this, I, I look Bring five G to South uh, Jersey. We, we, no, we heard the app, app thing. Uh, they want to know if you're. you're okay. Live well, uh, anyway. from Amiga. We have Wi-Fi <laughs> people. <up here. laughs> oh my god! Oi, Nick. I, I, next time you should have Roland just park in your driveway and, and use oh your Wi-Fi for the. Uh... Please. Please, everybody come. No, no, go ahead. No, I think you're clear now. Go. It's an opening. Oh, I, I was going to say, just Google Roland Team. I, I write under a pen name, Simone Scarlett. Look at this beautiful cover I designed myself. As we said, that was David Zariski's abs there. He scrubbed off the tattoos. But um, I write under Roland Team, and I just love being part of this community. I don't really necessarily think of things in a bigger way. So just find me wherever people like Calvin and Joe and you are. Love it. Love it. I love it. Hey, first of all, everybody on the panel, thank you so much. I know this takes time, takes effort, but you guys did a, an amazing job. And this was a lot of fun and a lot of laughs. People are still laughing in the chat room. Uh, and and by the way, speaking of chat room, I know I, I say that and it, it, it tends to objectify all of you, but all of you, thank you so much. This is the Bond community. And uh, thank you for joining. This is why we do what we do. And we will return for Octopus in the Living Daylights very soon. And this has been David Zaritsky for the Bond Experience. We'll see you all real soon. Take care, everyone.